you. Our our topic today is bonus disputes. Uh, and Georgina and I are going to cover a number of aspects that we think are interesting and opportune to review at this stage with the renewed impetus of the uh, recommendation by the Law Commission that the breach of contract jurisdiction be increased in the tribunal to 100k and of course the, the imminent scrapping of the regulatory cap on bankers bonuses. I'm going to start off on discretionary bonuses I'm going to talk about the before Braganza, then the seminal decision in Braganza, and uh, what has uh, what has gone beyond that, and then hand over to Georgina to talk about anti-avoidance terms, clawback clauses, penalty clauses, trade, trade issues around that, wrongful dismissal, and the least burdensome principle. So wh where we start on discretionary bonuses, going back in time to the heyday of early noughties uh, employment tribunal litigation and the uh, seminal uh, decision of Mr Justice Burton in Clark and Nomura. Clark was a profit machine, a mere 33 years old at the time of his dismissal a month before bonus payday, and the bank decided to award nil bonus, whereas his desk colleagues received between 2.5 and £7 million. Justifications supplied by the banks, many of them assembled post facto, included his dress and appearance and using his mobile phone at his desk. How life has changed. Uh, in, in reviewing the authorities, um, Mr. Justice Burton reviewed a ragbag of cases where discretions uh, had been scrutinised on the basis that they were arbitrary or that they were capricious. And he pulled these together and said that there is a test of irrationality or perversity. There is a duty on an employer when they are exercising uh, discretion uh, and deciding bonus to, not to act either irrationally or uh, perversely. And that because the exercise of discretion has to be done properly, it's not open to the employer to rely on justifications that it cobbles together after the fact, even if actually those may be uh, 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 genuine ones after the fact. And it couldn't rely on its own unjustified summary of dismissal. It has to have proper justifications that existed in the exercise that it took at the time. So the bank's justifications were rejected and Mr Clark awarded 1.3 million uh, and that of course set off feverish uh, pace of litigation it was approved by the uh, court of appeal in Hawkerlack in Cantor Fitzgerald and then in 2006 the court of appeal uh, again considered the question of uh, the exercise of discretion in the case of Keane uh, another landmark uh, decision but it drew rather a different line and set rather a different tone First of all, the Court of Appeal emphasised that it was not its function to usurp the bank's uh, exercise of discretion. The court was limited to a review function and to deciding whether the bank had, had acted in breach of contract in the manner in which it had approached the exercise of discretion. And the decision is best known for the off-quoted statement of Lord Justice Mummery uh, uh, that the bank has a very wide discretion that the claimant has to show that discretion has been exercised rationally and that there is an overwhelming case for a claimant to meet where so much depends on the discretionary judgment of a bank in fluctuating market and labour conditions. Uh, and that high bar is relied on over and over again. We'll see it even in the, even in the more recent cases. Possibly looking back, uh, the way in which that was expressed takes take some reflection from the feverish atmosphere of bankers bonuses at that point in the in the noughties but also the facts of the Keane case itself where his claim was in part that for two years he had been awarded a mere three million pounds bonus and that that was not enough. Uh, uh, he also said his bonus was irrational because it was below the recommendation made by his line manager as to the size of the pool from which his bonus should have been paid. But the bank had made the decision in line with relevant factors which were identified uh, in the clause itself. There's another uh, dictum of Lord Justice Moses that perhaps provides a bit more comfort to claimants. Uh, and in identifying, first of all, that the employer has, as part of the duty of trust and confidence, a duty to give reasons 
for the uh, decision that's made as to uh, the, the calculation of bonus. He then addressed what the employee has to do to prove uh, his or her case. And he said the employee must show something that tends to establish the perversity of the decision. Then, once they've shown something, then the absence of an explanation by the employer will lend powerful support to the case that the employee is bringing. And I'll return to that uh, a little further on, looking at the evidential position, the issues, uh, evidence as they stand now. The question of contractual discretion reached the Supreme Court in 2015 in Braganza, uh, and a, a very important case for us as employment lawyers, but a very atypical case in its facts. Not a bonus case, not a typical employment case. Um, Braganza had been lost at sea, and the widow challenged BP's finding after an investigation that he had committed suicide, because that meant that she was deprived of compensation under the contractual death and service benefit. The Supreme Court was split on whether the investigation had been sufficient. A majority found that there was a paucity of investigation, it was unsubstantial evidence, whereas the minority found that the reports were impressive in their extent and the care with which they were compiled. But where the Supreme Court spoke with one voice was in identifying that, that the uh, exercise of discretion is subject to a duty of rationality and perversity. And that duty is the one as set out in the Weddensbury case that operates in, in administrative law, and that it has two limbs critically. And Lady Hale in particular um, articulated this in her speech, first limb, whether the right matters have been taken into account in reaching the decision. So a process oriented approach, have relevant factors been considered and irrelevant factors been excluded from consideration. And second of all, whether the result is so outrageous that no reasonable decision maker would have reached it. Uh, and it's that second limb that up to this point had really taken up much of the analysis. Was it outrageous, capricious, un uh, unreasonable? And Lady Hill warned that focus on the outcome uh, uh, risked the court substituting its own decision. Uh, Lord Hodge addressed in his speech how this would fit into the more familiar case of employment bonuses. Um, he discussed the background to the GT rationality and perversity and noted that employment contracts have a special character. They re re rely on a personal relationship between employer and employee and can be described as relational contracts and a clear case, he said, where the Weddensbury GT should apply to contractual uh, discretion. And it was that personal relationship, he said, that justified a closer scrutiny of the exercise of discretion in employment cases than it would in a commercial case. He, he uh, made the point that there was a difference in the exercise that had been undertaken in Braganza, which was a fact-finding exercise, and the exercise of discretion in bonus cases, which would be a much more qualitative judgment. And in those cases, Lord Hodge said that there was little scope for intensive scrutiny. But he then, later on in his judgment, said that there was no reason the employer should be under less intense scrutiny than a public body. These um, rather difficult statements about scrutiny and the extent to which uh, uh, the exercise of a, a discussion bonus decision should be scrutinised came to be looked at in Pastoral, the first case to imply Braganza in an employment context. And in fact, I think mere three days after Braganza was hot off the press. Uh, and here the claimant made the submission that the law had moved on from the high water mark of Keene and Braganza had, had brought in a more generous uh, regime for, empl for, for employees. Mr Justice Singh considered what threshold the employer had to meet and he addressed head on the dictum of uh, Lord Hodge that an employer should not be subject to less intense scrutiny than a public body. 
And he said that he found that difficult to understand because in a judicial review case, the court doesn't substitute its own view, nor does it apply, he said, particularly intense scrutiny. It subjects the findings to review on a standard of irrationality or perversity. He repeated, that's the standard to be applied in employment cases. And he sounded a, a note of caution that it must be remembered that these are decisions being made in the private sphere where some of the uh, different duties that public authorities have are, are not in play. And I suggest that that takes us then to, to this position, that while there is more scrutiny than you'd have in, an, in a commercial contract, it is not a greater scrutiny than judicial review and not with all of the public law uh, uh, factors in mind and the public interest dimension uh, in mind. Keen remains correct that irrationality is a high threshold to reach, albeit that employer now has to satisfy two levels in order to show that they've acted within the duty uh, to act rationally. There's an expansion in FAITA, which are, I'm going to deal with briefly for, for the interest of time. It's, it's a good case to read because it takes through an analysis of the reasons that are put up by the employer, how they're scrutinised by, by the judge and how the uh, question of relevance and irrelevance uh, is sort of weighed out through the judgment. The particular significance of FAITA, it's a different type of situation. Here the employee was put on guard and leave in order to be held out of eligibility for the bonus. So it had a knock-on impact uh, and bonus that he would be paid. And the judge readily accepted that Braganza would apply to uh, a garden leave decision, not just putting on garden leave, but also to the review of garden leave. Uh, and to some extent, the employer was lucky that they hadn't been reviewing it, so they didn't have uh, further discretions that they had to justify. It fights is also a good example of a claim that's pleaded both under the implied term of trust and confidence and under the duty not to act uh, rationally or perversely. It's not always easy when reading the authorities to see the dividing line between those two terms and won't always be easy as practitioners and as advisors to assess which term is directly in play. But there are cases where there'll either be a clear line between them or it'll be both that are in play. A couple of points before I sweep up and hand over to uh, Georgina. Firstly, Brogdon and Investec is a, a good reminder that the key issue for employers is to understand which parts of the bonus provision, and when I say provision, you can have the contract, the handbook, policies, terms and conditions, which parts of that contractual framework truly are discretionary and which parts are going to be subject to normal contractual interpretation so that the employer is at risk of getting them either right or wrong. In Brogdon and Investec at first instance, uh, Mr Justice Leggett accepted that the calculation of uh, economic value added, the, the profit uh, figure essentially on which bonus was calculated, was a discretionary matter. The Court of Appeal disagreed with him and said, no, there's been a way of doing this. That's what the bank should follow. It's not discretionary, even though there are variable components within the, the calculation. Evidential uh, issues. Um, Hills and Nixon recent case um, reminds us of the point that um, well, Justice Moses made back in Keene, that although the, bur the burden of proof is borne by the claimant, and the claimant has the burden of proof throughout, where the claimant raises a prima facie case, where the claimant can show that there is something that suggests that the decision has been made uh, unlawfully, the burden will then shift to the employer. Um, uh, I reference the cogency of evidence. There are a number of dicta through Braganza that the more serious the exercise of discretion, the more serious the decision being made, the more cogent evidence will be required by the employer as to how that decision has been made. Uh, and Dalgleish is um, a uh, reminder to uh, employers of the peril of providing as numerous uh, employers did in the cases that we've discussed. Uh, providing no evidence. Where that all takes us, I suggest, is this, 
that the employer will always want to give enough reasons to satisfy uh, the the requirement under the implied term of uh, trust and confidence and to show why it is that the exercise of discretion has been done in the way that it has been, but not so much that it's going to get itself in more trouble than it needs to or provide uh, the claimant with grist to their mill. Claimants will, of course, want to take advantage of the duty to uh, to give reasons, uh, partly as a way of um, challenging uh, the uh, employer and being able to mount their own uh, evidence. Question I think that may next come up is, is there a right once the employee knows the reasons then to reply to a reason that it challenges, which is obviously bad? Um, that's our, our next talk. I'll hand you over to Georgina. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, in my part of the talk, I'm going to talk to you about three discrete issues, and you'll be pleased to hear it'll be about 15 minutes or so, and then we're going to break for lunch. First, the two ways I think you might seek to imply an anti-avoidance term into a contract of employment following a recent case law at home and abroad. Second, um, how you might seek to challenge clawback clauses through arguing that the clause constitutes a restraint of trade or penalty clause and how to draft uh, clawback clauses to avoid this. And third, the implications of the Court of Appeals decision in McKenzie NAA for you as advisors advising on the assessment of damages for wrongful dismissal. So turning first to anti-avoidance clauses, we frequently see employers exercising an express power in a contract to dismiss an employee before a bonus or other benefit falling due to avoid paying uh, the employee the same. One attempted so solution to this in bonus litigation has been for claimants to seek to imply an anti-avoidance clause into the contract. As you'll know, uh, the orthodox view is that following the cases of Reader Flag and Commerce Bank, English law doesn't recognise an implied anti-avoidance rule as part of the implied term of mutual trust and confidence as a means to fetter the express contractual right to terminate a contract of employment. The closest uh, that we've got in terms of recognising an implied anti-avoidance rule are the following remarks. First, the obiter remarks in Reader Flag at paragraph 53 that capriciously or arbitrarily singling out an employee for dismissal to deprive them of a bonus or benefit could be a breach of the implied term of mutual trust and confidence that would sound in damages for breach of contract. And second, the High Court in TACAS refusing to give summary judgment in a case where an implied anti-avoidance clause was pleaded, observing that this was a developing area of the law. As you'll also know, the rationale for refusing to imply an anti-avoidance term in those cases was a case uh, was a point stressed by Lord Millet in Johnson and Unisys that the implied term of mutual trust and confidence can't sensibly be used to extend the relationship beyond its agreed duration, and it cannot sensibly be used to circumscribe an express power of dismissal without cause. I think this is an area which merits uh, reconsideration following some interesting observations of the Hong Kong Court of Appeal in the case of Sunny and also our own Court of Appeal in the case of Byrne and Alder Hay, both of which uh, provide, I think, a means to imply an anti-avoidance clause into a contract of employment. Dealing first uh, with Sunny, where the Hong Kong Court of Appeal famously implied an anti-avoidance term such that the express term providing for termination without cause was subject to the requirement that it can only be exercised in good faith, rationally and for proper purpose, and not arbitrarily or capriciously, or in a manner which is not bona fide. Sunny gives us a means to imply that term by observing, relying on Lord Hoffman's observations in Johnson, that the express power to terminate and an implied term that the power could only be exercised in good faith are not necessarily inconsistent. It doesn't mean that an employer couldn't dismiss without cause, rather the employee would have an action for damages. I think the second way to imply an anti-avoidance clause in, um, is to rely upon the obiter remarks 
of Lord Justice Singh and Underhill in the case of Burns and Alder Hay in 2001, uh, which recognised an implied duty of procedural fairness as arising from the nature of the disciplinary process itself, as opposed to the implied term of mutual trust and confidence. You could utilise, I think, that implied duty to say that an employer breached the implied duty of procedural fairness in a disciplinary process, which led the claimant to being dismissed prior to becoming eligible for a bonus and saying that but for the breach, they would have been eligible for the bonus. So turning to the practical take home point from that, I think post Sunny and Older Hay, there are arguments out there that claimants can utilize to try to capture the lost bonus um, in a damages claim. So in my view, read a flag isn't the end of the debate. And I don't think employers can dismiss before bonus season with impunity. Turning to uh, the next issue I'd like to address, um, how to challenge clawback clauses, arguing that a clause uh, constitutes a restraint of trade or penalty clause, and what lessons we can take from the case law in drafting them. As you'll know, there are broadly three ways to challenge a clawback clause. First of all, you could argue uh, the circumstances don't fall within the clawback provisions and you might have a claim for breach of contract or unlawful deduction of wages. Secondly, you can challenge it on restraint of trade grounds. And third, you can challenge it on the basis that the clause constitutes a penalty clause. Turning to uh, restraint of trade, it's difficult to give you generalised rules as to what will amount to a restraint of trade, given so much is going to depend upon the factual matrix of the case in play. But there are some useful examples in the case law to keep in your back pocket as a starting point when you're approaching these issues. The first category of cases to uh, look at are cases where the provisions seek to attach financial disincentives to post-employment competitive activity. The case of Sadler is instructive and it involved a case which made an employee's right to receive post-termination commission subject to the provision that it would cease immediately if they moved to a competitor within the same industry. The High Court had no difficulty in finding that that was a restraint of trade as it limited his ability to undertake employment in whatever field he chose. A further useful example uh, is the case of Singh, a Singaporean case involving forfeiture of LTIPs, which had already invested, uh, already vested, but hadn't been distributed. And the Court of Appeal held that the restraint of trade doctrine could apply to vested LTIPs. The second category of uh, cases to look at are cases where the provisions seek to attach financial disincentives to leaving employment. And the instructive case in this respect is the case of Tullet. And in that case, the High Court found that repaying a sign-on bonus or retention bonus where an employee failed to serve their full term of employment wasn't a restraint of trade. The provision did not affect the employee's ability to work after leaving. Tullet also made some remarks in respect of a prior decision of the Court of Appeal in Hubble which held that repayment of training costs when an employee leaves, irrespective of whether they went to a competitor or not, was a restraint of trade. I think Tullet's probably right in that respect, in, in doubting that reasoning. And in any event, Hubble was concerned with an appeal relating to the refusal of summary judgment, so isn't determinative um, as to the issue. So in terms of the practical take home point to take away from, from this part of the talk, um, a way around the restraint of trade doctrine, if you're drafting clawback clauses, is to draft with Tullet in mind and to use uh, payment as conditionable upon the continued employment with that employer. The next issue I'd like to consider is um, penalty clauses. Now, what is a penalty clause? Well, you all know um, the decision in Cavendish and McDessey uh, set out on the slide there for you gives you the definition. In other words, penalising an employee for a breach of contract as opposed to compensating the employer for loss. And the important point to note here is that it needs to operate in circumstances where the employee has breached the contract of employment. And two cases have considered the penalty clause um, in this context, which provide helpful guidance. The first, again, uh, the case of Tullet, 
as we've discussed, the case that held that a clause um, that provided that a sign-on or retention bonus was pay repayable upon leaving wasn't a penalty clause, as payments under them weren't reliant upon the employee breaching their contracts of employment. Second, uh, the case of uh, Nosworthy, um, a case which held that a bad leave call clause which affected an employee's entitlement to earn out shares and loan notes wasn't a penalty clause, um, as bad lever was defined as including an employee who voluntarily resigned on notice, so there was no breach of contract uh, by the employee. As to the proportionality of the detriment, when drafting these clauses, you might want to think about the seniority of the individuals involved and also varying the level of payment depending on, for example, the length of time that they been, uh, were employed. In the final part of this talk, I'd like to discuss the implications of the Court of Appeals decision in uh, McKenzie and AA for you as advisors advising on the assessment of damages in, for wrongful dismissal and whether that can include future bonuses. In order to do so, I have to set out some background to the case for the practical take home points to make any sense. But I'll draw the threads together at the end so you understand the practical significance. McKenzie was a case which involved an attack upon the least burdensome principle in calculating damages for wrongful dismissal. That is the doctrine that where there are several ways in which a contract might be performed, the mode that should be adopted is, is that which is least burdensome to the defendant. Now, the doctrine affects bonus in circumstances, as in the circumstances of the case in McKenzie, where termination can take place by an employer electing to trigger a peel-on clause and um, permitting payment of basic salary in lieu of notice, or providing notice itself. In those circumstances, as in McKenzie, the employer will argue that the least burdensome mode of performance is to exercise the peel-on clause, as opposed to keeping the employee in employment for the notice period, during which time they might accrue a bonus or benefit. Now, the judge at first instance in McKenzie struck out the uh, bonus and benefits claim in this case and held that the least burdensome course of, con course of action for an employer in a wrongful dismissal claim involves assumption of the earliest possible uh, termination. On appeal, one of the grounds sought to attack the ambiguity around the least burdensome principle and the judge at first instance having equated equated that to either the cheapest or earliest termination, as opposed to something that required factual inquiry in each case. Um, and in McKenzie, the Court of Appeal upheld the High Court's decision to strike out the claim for the bonus and the benefits as having no reasonable prospect of success, and that on the facts in that case, the exercise of the peel-on clause was the least burdensome mode of terminating the contract. However, and here we come to the uh, practical take home point, it also spelt out at paragraph 43 that there is no rule of law that in every case the cheapest or quickest mode of termination of a contract of employment will be the least burdensome. In some cases, it may be open to reasonable debate what is the least or least burdensome mode of performing or terminating a contract. So the implications of that statement are when seeking damages for wrongful dismissal and considering bonus, don't assume that the peel on clause is the least uh, burdensome mode of performance. That may be up for debate in the case and affect quantification of damages, including the ability to claim for the bonus. So in summary, the take home points from my part of the talk. First of all, don't assume you can fire an employee because they are due a, a bonus with impunity. It's a developing area of the law, and I think there are two ways in which you could imply an anti-avoidance term into a contract of employment on the basis of the reasoning in Sunny and also Alder Hay. Second, when drafting uh, clawback clauses, safest to draft as set out in Tullet, so as to avoid restraint of trade or penalty clause arguments. And third, uh, when assessing damages for wrongful dismissal, post McKenzie and AA, don't assume the least burdensome mode of performance is to exercise a peel-on clause as opposed to termination with notice, which could capture bonus claims. <laughs>